Welcome. I'm going to uh, abbreviate my talk in the interest of time, and many of the things I was going to say have been said, but there are a couple of things I really want to try to say here. First of all, I want to say that I'm very honored to be here uh, to commemorate Dr. Lown and for us to remember that it's the 77th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima, and in three days it'll be the 77th anniversary of the bombing of Nagasaki. I am Dr. Doug Gracefield, uh, and I am from PSR, Maine, and uh, I, the promo said that I'm the leader of it, but I'm not the leader of it, just one of the members of it. PSR Maine is not just physicians, but a group of many health professionals and informed citizens that are tr trying to address issues that, for which there is no cure and that we only can offer prevention. And those are nuclear issues, climate change, environmental toxins, and all the social injustice and inequities that go with those. This is the real reason I'm here today with my grandchildren. And uh, I'm here trying to make the world a better place for them because, as Dr. Uh, Lown said, we've screwed it up. So. Here's photos from 77 years ago on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Aerial photos showing before and after. Uh, before, densely populated, thriving cities. After, total devastation. One bomb, one bomb for each city. We needed to learn what that really meant. So the US government formed a commission to send doctors to study the survivors. That study was ongoing for years and proved beyond question the difference in atomic weapons, nuclear weapons versus conventional weapons, that they had a long-lasting and an ever, almost everlasting effect on human beings, unlike conventional weapons. However, that information was classified. It wasn't released to the public. And so, when Dr. Lamb was in medical school, this is a picture of his class at Harvard, uh, you see him? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, there's something wrong with this picture. Can anybody tell me what it is? No women. Well, that's it. <laughs> it's all male. It's all white. And except for Dr. Lown and maybe one or two others, it was all Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, men. Uh, and the view of medicine at that time was encapsulated by this quote from the American Medical Association, which says, nuclear issues are not, are political, not medical. Doctors have no particular expertise and should not meddle in things they know nothing about. The general public didn't understand really what atomic weapons were. They knew they were powerful, they knew they were to be feared, but a bomb was a bomb. You see a bomb from World War II, it's a one-ton bomb. The bomb on the right, not much bigger. It's the one they dropped on Hiroshima. It's in fact 15,000 times more powerful than the one that the man's sitting on. And similarly, because information was kept from the American public, we believed that we could have uh, public uh, safety, that we could duck and cover, that we could have fallout shelters, that we could survive. And that because we could survive, we could justify having nuclear weapons and thinking about using them. And to achieve that, the nuclear powers were testing nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, on the surface of the Earth, routinely. There were almost 2,000 of those tests done. And they weren't small. They weren't small at all. A, a mere 500 of those had the equivalent explosive power of 29,000 Hiroshima bombs. So not only the explosive power, but the fallout that was generated from these. So fallout, the three principal things that are in fallout are iodine-131, cesium-137, and strontium-90. I'm gonna talk about two of those, iodine-131 and strontium-90. And this cartoon illustration here shows that fallout 
from the bomb gets into the upper atmosphere and spreads across the country. This is an illustration of that iodine-131. It eventually settles. It's on the grass. The cows eat it. It's in the milk. The children drink the milk. The iodine-131 is concentrated in their thyroid. And years later, they have thyroid cancer. Strontium-90 replaces calcium in our bones and our teeth. And it has a similar pattern. And it also reached its way into milk and found its way into children. Physicians really did begin to alert the public. This woman, Dr. Louise Rice, was a pediatrician in St. Louis. And they had the idea that if they got people to send in baby teeth that had been shed, they could analyze them for strontium-90. And if they knew what years the teeth had been shed, they could make a pattern as to whether fallout was coming over St. Louis and whether children were accumulating strontium-90 in their teeth. And it turns out that they were. And she published that finding. Eventually it was proven that children in 1968 who shed teeth, they had 50 times the strontium in their teeth from teeth that were from 1950 when testing had just been begun. These tests were confirmed across the country, led to an outrage in mothers in the United States, and led to John F. Kennedy uh, having to form, having to agree with the Russians and the Brits to stop testing nuclear weapons in the, in the atmosphere. Dr. Bernard Lamb, you've heard a great deal about him. We all, I, we all in PSR stand in his debt. He was one of the founders of the organization. His cardiac work in, in and of itself would give him a place in history forever. But as he said, the real threat in the world was not cardiac, but nuclear. And how could I, as a doctor, close my eyes to this overwhelming reality? The signature event that put the physicians in the United States and the world on notice was the fact that Dr. Lown and others wrote articles that the New England Journal agreed to publish on the medical consequences of nuclear war. And once that was done, it was no longer deniable that nuclear weapons, there was no medical response possible for nuclear weapons. And the only response to them had to be to prevent them. He forms an IPPNW and receives the Nobel Prize, as we've been told. He, influenced, he and Chazov influenced Gorbachev and Reagan. And they, uh, that results in the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty, which for the first time resulted in nuclear weapons being destroyed. Here's a graph of the nuclear weapons in the world. You see this steady ex uh, increase, uh, almost dramatically steep increase in nuclear weapons until the treaty, which is the peak. And from there, nuclear weapons start to come down. But you'll notice the problem. There's a plateau at the end, and that's the plateau we're living in now. There are nine nuclear countries. The United States and Russia have 95% of the nuclear weapons, but there are nuclear weapons in not only China, the United States and Russia, but China, France, and the UK, as well as Pakistan, India, Israel and north, down North Korea. So what international response can we make to this? Well, yet another legacy of Dr. Uh, Lowndes is that IPPNW formed an organization to specifically deal with the international problem of the nuclear weapons. And that organization is the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN. And they formed the organization and started worldwide cooperation that resulted in uh, the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. For that work, a second Nobel Prize was awarded that is part of Dr. Lowndes' legacy. And I can receive that in 2017. Shown here are Setsko Thurlow and Beatrice Finn. Setsko is a, uh, a boss, a boss. Bakshu, excuse me, my Japanese is very good, which means that she's a nuclear survivor. 
So what is the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons? It is a legally binding treaty for which now 66 countries have ratified and are totally bound by those agreements. A total of 86 countries have signed their intent to uh, join this treaty. As you might expect, and unfortunately, none of the nuclear aligned countries in the world have uh, participated in this treaty. But it is a legally binding treaty that prohibits the use and threatening to use nuclear weapons, prohibits the development, the testing, production, manufacture, possession, or station of nuclear weapons in a country that signs the treaty. What about the United States? Well, the United States continues to be a nuclear power, as I've shown. Uh, the nuclear posture of the United States is and continues to be a nuclear triad. We have three ways of delivering nuclear weapons. The one that was first developed was the airplane. Then we had intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles that were land-based. And then we developed nuclear submarines that were capable of firing nuclear warheads on intercontinental ballistic missiles from uh, under the sea and are totally undetectable. Not only do we have this triad, but we're now in the process of, rather than dissembling it, we're now modernizing all of it. And the Congressional Budget Office estimates that that's going to cost us $1.2 trillion to uh, renovate our nuclear arsenals. What about the rest of the U.S. nuclear policy? Well, you may or may not know that the United States maintains the right to use nuclear weapons first. We're the only country that's ever used them. But we continue to maintain that there are situations where we should use nuclear weapons even if we are not attacked by nuclear weapons. And, as you probably know, the sole authority to land, launch nuclear weapons resides with the President of the United States. The President can convene the Pentagon within seconds. He can tell the Pentagon that he wants to attack with nuclear weapons. Some of the Pentagon may disagree, but those that agree are bound to follow the command of the Commander-in-Chief and to send the codes to launch nuclear weapons. So the Pentagon sends the codes, like this complicated, long, multiple letter code that you see there, and they can send it to a submarine that's completely submerged in an unknown, unknown a location known really to no one, and once the uh, commander of that vessel and two executive officers confirm that the code that they've just received is real, they open a safe and they launch the missiles. And that happens within five minutes. One of those Columbia, uh, excuse me, Ohio class submarines that carry 20 missiles with multiple warheads one of those submarines has more explosive power than was used in all of World War II. We also have a policy of launch on warning or the air trigger alert. Submarines and intercontinental ballistic missiles are in a state of constant readiness to be fired at the command of the president within minutes. If there's a mistake or a misunderstanding the order is given, there's precious little time to reconsider whether it's a mistake. We started out having B-52s flying constantly with nuclear weapons, uh, flying patterns that would allow them to attack Russia or the Soviet Union at that time. They no longer carry, they no longer have airplanes in the air, but the intercontinental ballistic missiles and the submarines are already uh, in on air trigger alert. So what can we do about the U.S. policy? Well, Physicians for Social Responsibility and the Union for Concerned Scientists decided to develop a program called Back from the Brink, because we are on the brink of nuclear war, either by accident, unintended, or by miscalculation. And we're addressing five 
specific points with back from the brink. We should actively pursue a verifiable agreement among nuclear armed states to eliminate their nuclear arsenals. We should renounce the option of using nuclear weapons first. We should end the sole unchecked authority of any president to launch a nuclear attack. We should be taking U.S. nuclear weapons off hair trigger alert. And we should be canceling the plan to replace the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal with enhanced weapons. A bill to uh, do just that has been introduced uh, in Congress. It's House Resolution 1185. Representative Pingree is one of the co-sponsors of that. One of the things you can do is that you can um, encourage Representative Golden to endorse that. And you can also encourage our two senators, Collins and King, to introduce similar legislation in the Senate. Back from the Brink has been widely accepted across the country. There are uh, 309 organizations, including Pox Christi, Peace Action, Veterans for Peace, in addition to PSR, that have endorsed it. Many municipalities have endorsed it. Chicago, New York, and here in Maine, Portland, Bangor, and Hallowell. I would welcome any of you who would like to work on how to do this in your own town. PSR would be happy to work with you to do that. And finally, um, join, you, look to these organizations that are here today and follow them and look for their guidance on things that are happening uh, in our ways to re remove nuclear weapons. So I thank you for your attention and I thank you for, I know many of you have devoted years and years of energy to this topic and I thank you for that. Um, let's move forward.